a lot of investors make the mistake of jumping into the market and looking at deals. Um, they may find good deals, but then they're rushing around trying to place it with an operating partner instead of spending the time to do the due diligence and understand what operating partner you want to work with. Because, and people were like, how can you afford to do this? And it's like, well, how can I afford not to do this? We're building a business that's, you know, if you're building a legacy business and you're giving poor advice, that's going to come back to bite you in the ass. If you lean in and do stupid deals, people are going to look back and say, why did you do that deal? That was a stupid deal. And, and so, you know, there's a difference between getting it wrong, right? And that can happen and, and being foolish right? Just like, because I need to get a deal done. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast. Today, we are joined by uh, Tyler Goodwin, founder and CEO of Seaforth Land. He has got over 30 years global real estate experience and has worked in property development, advisory, investment banking, principal investment and investment management, and has lived and worked in North America, Asia, and Europe. He's held positions at firms including JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, Urban Land Capital, Loder, and set Seaforth Land up in 2015 to revitalize iconic buildings and realize inspiring schemes with a focus on central London commercial real estate. Tyler, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Not at all. Well, look, you've had a fascinating, very varied career. Yep. Uh, and I think we could probably uh, sit down for 10 different podcast episodes to unpick each one. So uh, we'll do our best to try and get uh, it into an hour. But a place that I always like to start these podcasts is how, how did you get into to real estate and why real estate? Yeah, I think uh, one of the unique advantages to uh, going to school in North America versus here is the uh, is the fact that you can change your undergrad uh, studies. So in your first year, you go in and do general studies. Mine was marketing management, um, and uh, and then suddenly uh, I started learning a little bit more about real estate, and I thought, okay, this is fascinating, and I changed my changed my major, um, and that was it. It was just. The right, uh, the right professor, the right fellow students, and uh, and I was bit by the bug. Um, and actually, I should touch on this because it's something that we've learned from at at Seaforth. Um, you know, there's a real issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the UK, uh, a, a lack thereof. Um, and uh, because so many of these young kids, call them like if they're black, Asian, uh, Middle Eastern kids, minority ethnic kids um, from inner city youth. They might look at our industry and see this lack of diversity and say, you know what, I'm going to pick something else because they need to pick in the sixth form. Uh, so we partner with the Mayor's Fund for London um, and uh, and we do a, uh, a quarterly teach in with these kids and then lunch and we tell them about the industry. And, and you know, I think my in my experience and uh, broad range of experience within the real estate industry is a great example of how broad a church this is. Um, you can be a real estate finance person. You can be a real estate marketing person. You can be construction, engineering, um, you know, asset management. There's such a broad range of asset uh, strategies within real estate that you can work on. Um, and so getting to these six form kids early, um, giving them work experience and, uh, and getting them uh, getting them started on their uh, on their educational paths while they have choice. Um, has been something that's really fulfilling for us and, and something that I think the industry, you know, could do more of. Yeah, we'll probably come on to it later, but um, yep. I know you've got the C4 scholarship program yes. uh, as a way to kind of give back. But um, for you then, you had no family or friends or, no. you know, no other context other than no, lecturer? My, no, my dad, uh, my dad uh, was a farmer uh, in Ireland and immigrated to Canada in 1956 at 20 years old. And, you know, I think 20 bucks in his pocket. And my mom was uh, from a small town in Medicine Hat, Alberta. Uh, so no real estate background on either side of the family. So you graduated um, having kind of switched your course and got yep. into real estate that way. What, what was your first role and where did you land? Um, I landed in a, in a firm called Coldwell Banker Commercial, which is the precursor to C, CBRE uh, and, uh, in Vancouver and uh, cut my teeth there. Um, in that industry, um, in North America, you you eat what you kill. 
Um, it's a full commission business. And, uh, and so you have to hit the ground running, uh, in the first year you're working as a mentee. Uh, so there's a, there's a mentor that, that you work under, um, and that, uh, that helps you kind of get your bearing and, uh, but, uh, but then you're, you're off and, uh, and, and making money yourself. And that's in an investment agency capacity? Yeah, or? so I did both uh, sales and leasing and, um, and kind of worked a territory. That was the way it worked a little bit like the way the city and the, uh, the West End and, and other mar- markets work here. Um, and, uh, you know, what was fascinating very early on in my career um, is that the, uh, the wave of immigration coming in from Hong Kong. So if you remember back in, I think it was 88, uh, the British government made clear the handover plans in 1997. Um, and uh, a lot of the Hong Kong Chinese that had been through the Cultural Revolution realized that or remembered what it had been like and said, you know what, I want to I want to spread my bets and have a safe harbor. Um, typically, what they did is they moved their families to North America, often Vancouver or Toronto or San Francisco. Um, but Vancouver was a big uh, port of entry and um, they'd set up. They might buy some buildings, make some investments, and then they'd start commuting. They were referred to as astronauts, where they would literally commute back and forth with their family in Vancouver and uh, and their business in Hong Kong. So I learned uh, I learned a lot about doing business with Asian uh, Asian businessmen, and they all said the same thing. They said, "You know, you should be in Asia. You know, it's where the action is, and Vancouver's great, but it's quiet." Um, and I kept hearing that and hearing that. And then, you know, somebody came along and actually invited me to come work there. So where in Asia did you land and what was the role? Jakarta, Indonesia, um, back in, uh, I mean, they, they asked me to come out in 1991, uh, and, uh, checked it out. It was extraordinary. Uh, back then it was really the wild East. Uh, I can remember getting off the airplane, uh, onto the tarmac and getting hit with this wall of humidity and dust and smell of, you know, what was Indonesia and and just saying I was bit right away, had to do it. Uh, I realized if I didn't try it, um, you know, I'd always ask myself, you know, what if? And uh, so it was with a firm called Vigers, uh, which uh, they had a global platform uh, and they were expanding it in Asia. And at 24 years old, um, it was fascinating because the guy was offering me roles in different offices. And then he, he came to me, uh, James King was his name and said, um, said, I've got a job, a role that I can't fill. And, uh, I was like, okay, that was interesting. And he said, Jakarta, Indonesia, it's to open the office. I was 24 years old. I said, well, let me think about it. And I quickly ran to the library, not knowing anything about Indonesia. I knew approximately where it was on the map, but honestly, I couldn't have pinpointed Jakarta if I were paid. Um, and, uh, and, you know, back then there wasn't the internet. So public library did some research. Three weeks later, I was on a plane checking it out. And a few months later, I was uh, on the ground opening the office. And what was the role that you were doing? It was to open an office. Uh, it was uh, basically agency, but really our core business was valuation and consultancy. And, uh, and how we we ramped up the business quickly and, and made a success of it. I'd love to say it was just me. Uh, you know, it didn't hurt that it was the beginning of the Asian tiger economies. Uh, but, but it was really about um, working for the banks and going in and telling them, look, we've seen the valuation quality and feasibility study quality that you guys are getting. We can do much better. Give us a chance. Um, and they did. And we offered a much better product and, uh, and started stealing market share. And I think, you know, by the time, you know, I left, um, which is an interesting story, we were up to 16 or 20 people. It was fast and it, it within one year. Wow. Yeah. And uh, the guy that hired me told me, look, it's a one year contract. Um, you have to stay out the year. The uh, And then I suspect you'll get double what you're getting paid. And I thought there was no way I was getting double because I, at 24, I was given a car, a driver, house, staff, US dollars tax-free and a, you know, airfare home. Uh, And I thought, okay, there's no way anybody's paying double. And that literally was the conversation. It was like, you know, hey, what are you getting paid? And, you know, we'll pay you double. 
and that was to move or that was yeah so then i went to the buy side so that was my agency career uh as it, it was it was fantastic it was a great experience but going to the development side in indonesia back in the early 1990s we started on residential multifamily um residential single family residential townhouses office buildings it was really at such an extraordinary time um, that you could do no wrong until, of course, the Asia financial crisis happened. Uh, so, you know, I, I landed there in 1992. Uh, by 1997, the Asia financial crisis played out. At that point, we had a development called Four Seasons Residences. It was the largest and actually the world's first all residential uh, development with Four Seasons, uh, four towers, about a million square feet, luxury in the center of Jakarta, really beautiful product uh, designed by RTKL. Um, and we had sold off one tower. We were partially selling off the next when all hell broke loose. Um, and, uh, you know, if you recall back in May 1998, there were riots in the street. It was the overthrow of Saharto. Um, I was on the ground you know, I actually got on the back of a motorcycle um, and went up in Dakota into the riots, put on a vest, two cameras, uh, pretended I was the press. I can speak fluent Indonesian. Um, and uh, and I started taking photos and video of what was going on. Um, it was absolutely extraordinary. And, and I think a, it's, it's, it's taught me a lot. Uh, you know, I stayed on until 1999 uh, but it's taught me a lot about crisis management um, and, uh, you know, your attention to, you know, focusing on the work at hand uh, and trying to stay rational while everybody is losing rationality around you, um, which was a common theme back in the Asia financial crisis. Um, but also in terms of underwriting, uh, it really your stress test scenario is far more extreme. In my experience, my stress test scenario is far more extreme than most of my peers. It's like, well, how bad can it get? Yeah. And I think that's what's prepared us well, really well for what's happened in, in the economy that we're seeing here today. Um, we were risk off very quickly. We, the last asset we bought was 2019. And, you know, we looked at a bunch of deals, uh, pursued very few. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when our partners and clients asked us, what do you think? We are like, we have a thesis, but, I don't think the thesis is robust enough yet to make investment decisions. This this has some legs. What's going on here at this devolution? We wrote an article back in 2019 about the um, the deterioration of structural demand in office space and the bifurcation of the office market. This is before COVID. Yeah, I was going to say before COVID. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so I, which we were prescient. I mean, we we got it right. Fortunately, um, we couldn't have anticipated how those dynamics accelerated through COVID. So you ended up spending 20 years out in Asia. Can yeah. you just talk to me about the different roles that you had and how they came about? Yeah. Um, and my assumptions is the market is very different to over here, you know, lack of regulation, um, maybe different planning laws or remits or uh, yeah, government um, goals that you had to kind of hit. Can you just kind of paint a little bit of a picture of A, the market, but also the different roles that you had there and how that evolved? Of course. So, so you know, well, just rewind to, to, you know, 1998, Asia financial crisis, we're, we're kind of going through hell there. Um, I am, I'm speaking at a conference in Dallas at the Urban Land Institute fall meeting. Um, because they wanted to hear from a developer that was experiencing the Asia financial crisis. And one of the gentlemen that came up to me, um, Alan Creditor, who was the founder of USC's real estate program at the University of Southern California, came up to me and said, well, what an experience. What are you going to do next? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm doing it. I was working for the Salim family, a, group, a company called Tewara Wibawa, which was you know, the largest conglomerate family in Indonesia. Um, doing this Four Seasons development, among other things. And um, and uh, I just was so focused on crisis management and managing through our joint venture and, and other issues that that I hadn't really thought how long this was going to last. And, and Alan had experience in Indonesia. I said, you know, this is going to 
take years to, to unwind what's happening here. You should think about going back to school. Never thought about it. I figured that was it. I was done with school. Um, and uh, next thing I know, I received an application form for the master's degree uh, at, at USA, master's in real estate development with a yellow sticky saying, write the GMAT, let me know how it goes. And uh, I freshly married. Um, and uh, I said to my wife, what do you think? And that was it. Uh, so I joined, uh, I, I moved to Los Angeles, California, studied at USC. And, you know, one thing that I learned uh, during this crisis, uh, which was a really valuable lesson as well, is um, back then they were called real estate vulture funds. All right. It was the early, early time of real estate private equity. And uh, so while we were going through crisis, people were landing in Jakarta, coming to meet us and saying, so what are you interested in selling? Give us an idea of pricing. And the light went on for me the first time. Prior to this, I'd always thought, well, I was told that, you know, real estate is cyclical, as we know. You make money at the top and you, you bide your time at the bottom. And, uh, and then suddenly, here are people that are investing at the bottom, counter cyclical real estate investing. First time I thought about it. And I went, okay. That's what I want to do. I want to know how I can make money at the top and at the bottom. And uh, so when I went back to school, um, I immediately started applying to Wall Street. I was like, that's the only job I wanted. Um, and I started interviewing there. Um, and uh, I mean, the day I started at USC, I started reaching out to people saying I'm a student at USC getting my master's degree. Most of Wall Street hired uh, East Coast not so many people from USC back then. USC's real estate program is world class. Now there are a lot more people in real estate private equity that come out of the real estate program there. Um, but at the time it was very uncommon. Most people that went to USC stayed in California. It's an awesome place to work and live. And it was a massive uh, real estate economy. Um, and the guy that interviewed me uh, at Deutsche Bank was a guy by the name of Kurt Roloffs, who is our chairman at Seaforth. He's my partner in the business and has been my mentor ever since. Um, but, you know, as Kurt would tell the story, um, you know, basically I kept harassing him until he decided to pick up the phone and accept my call and said, well, look, if you ever make it to New York, I'm happy to meet with you. And of course, I was it wasn't much longer. Uh, I jumped on a plane and went to meet him. And uh, and that's where I got my start. Uh, so Deutsche Bank in New York, it was meant to be briefly uh, because he wanted me to move back to Asia, to Hong Kong. Um, and, uh, and then the World Trade Center transaction came up uh, and uh, a, a senior banker, a guy by the name of Ed Carey, kind of, I was an associate there. So I was an old associate. I was 30 years, over 30 years old. Um, and that was part of the deal of joining Deutsche. It's like, look, most of these kids, they're, you know, they started banking earlier. You're starting much later. You gotta, you gotta cut your teeth in the in the associate pool, which, you know, I'm all right. I'm, I'm happy to, you know, work my way through stuff like that. And uh, and you know, Ed said, "Look, we're working on this transaction. If any of you have any ideas, uh, this was on a Friday. Come to me on a Monday on the Monday with your thoughts." And I, it was a three billion dollar transaction. It was the at that point one of the largest real estate transactions. I'd ever seen, uh, and really the market had ever seen. I think I worked like 30 hours over the next 48 hours to put together an analysis and proposal. I had access to the data room, so I did uh, did some analysis. And on Monday morning, with very little sleep, I put my proposal on his desk, and it turned out I thought everybody would do that. It turns out nobody did that. He says, "Wow, you really want to work on this?" And I said, "Yeah, it's an awesome transaction." So. Uh, that was 10 months uh, of my life just on the World Trade Center transaction and some financing and other stuff for other guys there. But but that took up a lot of our time. Um, we were partnering with Brookfield um, and uh, ultimately we were the cover bidder to Larry Silverstein who won that asset. And uh, that was my the beginning of my move to uh, to Asia, back to Asia. Back to Asia. So after a stint in New York at Deutsche, you moved back to Asia. That's this right. This time with more of a private equity 
mindset, schooling, training, um, and experience, right? Yeah, and that's right. Um, so, so back then, uh, you could also, what it was, uh, it was a, the golden era for real estate private equity. Uh, if you didn't mind managing conflict of interest, um, a lot of the firms were both advisory as well as principal investing. So Deutsche, you know, when we started, uh, I was invited uh, to work on the transaction to advise Brookfield on the purchase of the World Trade Center. After a few, I mean, I guess it was a few weeks, we were looking at the numbers we were running and going, wow, this is a profitable business. And we realized that Brookfield were looking for some capital for the joint venture uh, or for the acquisition. And uh, so then we put on our, our principal hats, said, you know, if you're looking for capital, we can also be a co-investor in the strategy. Um, nowadays, you really can't do that. You've got to divide, uh, you, you separate your investment management from your principal investing business, which is the right thing to do because uh, conflicts of interest did arise and there were a lot of firms that actually got caught on the wrong side of managing that conflict. Um, we, I think, did a great job on it. Um, and uh, when I moved to Asia, that was all starting to change. When I moved with Deutsche to Asia, that was all starting to change. And um, and we became the real estate private equity. I actually changed a few times, but at first it was real estate private equity group and then real estate opportunities group. Uh, you know, as banks will often do, they'll kind of, as they're refining the uh, the business strategy as a principal investment platform. And so you landed back in Asia and your remit was to what? Buy up cheap uh, real estate at the time? Yeah, um, so it was Hong Kong. And it's it's not quite that simple uh, because, uh, you know, as, a, as an investor, um, it's not always about buying cheap. It's about buying well. Uh, and... Uh, you know, the first job is actually to sink your teeth into the markets that you want to invest in. Uh, so I'm a big believer in planning your work and working your plan, as is Kurt, and it's a big part of our culture at Seaforth. Um, so the first thing you do is write your business plan uh, for each of the markets that you want to invest in, understanding its risks and mitigants, understanding the opportunity and the major players. As a as a financial investor, you're also mapping out who you want to be an operating partner with, that's that's critically important. Uh, a lot of investors make the mistake of jumping into the market and looking at deals. Um, they may find good deals, but then they're rushing around trying to place it with an operating partner instead of spending the time to do the due diligence and understand what operating partner you want to work with. Because doing a good deal is only half the battle. To make your money, you actually have to execute a business plan. You need a business partner, an operating partner with the right alignment, with a commitment to transparency, that understand fiduciary obligations, that understand, uh, as an investor, I would always go in and, and start meetings with, right, let's talk about tag along, drag along provisions in joint venture agreements. Let's talk about reps and warranties. Let's talk about minority shareholder provisions. These are the things, if you think about operating partners, a lot of operators come from the agency brokerage side, which is about doing deals. And because they know how to do deals, they think they can be private equity investors. But when you start dragging them into these, these concepts of true fiduciary duty, transparency, and the, the threats to your business, if you do something wrong, they, they start going, whoa, hold on a second. These reps and warranties are quite onerous. The, the bad boy clauses are quite onerous. Instead of saying, yeah, okay, if I'm guilty of uh, willful uh, negligence or fraud, yeah, I should get the book thrown at me. And in fact, when we set up Seaforth, um, we, we became FCA regulated almost immediately because, you know, I think that, you know, first of all, I come from a regulated background, so I understand the importance of that. But also, I think for our most important clients, they look at that and they, it gives them a level of confidence. And it's a differentiating element for us that, that look, we, we get it. I've sat on your side of the table. I understand what's going to worry you and keep you up at night. And, and we're really on the same, we're at the same table with these yeah. partners. So an operating partner is someone who's got local expertise and has got a demonstrable track record in that market. And they will partner with capital yes. who has got the capital, but might not necessarily have the day-to-day -day, uh, desire or willing to do the heavy lifting in terms of acquiring and then delivering a, a business 
business plan just yeah. for, just for people listening who might not it's understand a, like where that relationship fits and how it it's works a, it's a great point and, and actually the best financial partners like if you think about my background i was a developer all right i started an agency then i did development to, to understand and have empathy for the operating partner is really important and i think a lot of financial investors have that now so uh, if you if you see back in those early years um most of the institutional investment invested by way of funds. It was less about direct investing. And then this real estate private equity philosophy started direct investing in, in real estate, doing deal by deal alongside operating partners. Um, the best businesses build, build in-house capabilities that understand the role and understand the capabilities and how do we evaluate the capabilities of operating partners. Um, they may have done it themselves. Now they're representing the financial investors. So because even financial investors often have a fiduciary duty to their stakeholders. So if you're a pension fund, you're a pension fund, you're investing your pension holders capital. That's their future. That's their retirement. Um, so they have a duty to their investors as well. And so, you know, our duty is to our financial partner and the financial partner will have a duty to their actual stakeholders. How long did you spend out in Asia after this? And what kind of, what year, what year are we talking in kind of now? Is it the um, early 2000s? So back in 2000 and, uh, uh, 2001. Okay. Um, so back in Hong Kong in 2001. So it was just, uh, just before the, uh, the, the World Trade Center was knocked down. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, um, and then, you know, I was spending uh, a lot of time in China, a lot of time in Hong Kong. Uh, time in Southeast Asia, um, you know, the firm was quite interested in investing in Indonesia. Um, obviously, as a, an institutional investor, you have to be concerned about matters like Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, and, you know, there are markets, emerging markets in Asia where, you know, they do business differently. Uh, and so part of your job is to make sure that you're protecting the reputation of your firm. And, and I looked at business and doing business in Indonesia at that point, it would have been too challenging for, uh, for, for I think, Deutsche um, on the direct principal investing side of the business. They've been very successful in investment banking and other elements of the business there. Um, and, uh, um, but got yeah, a lot of time in China and a lot of time in, uh, in Hong Kong. You moved on from Deutsche. Yes. Um, what did you move to and what was that role and why did you move? Yeah, so Deutsche, um, Deutsche went from a principal business to a third party funds management business. Um, so what does that they, mean? Yeah, so after they acquired Reef, uh, principal business is when you're investing the bank's balance sheet. Yep. Um, and after 2001, um, there were a lot of banks that were investing the bank's balance sheet in dot .com uh, and ended up getting burned. And then analysts started asking the question, should you really be exposing so much of the bank's balance sheet to alternative asset classes? Isn't that better suited as a third party funds management business? Deutsche agreed, raised, uh, first of all, acquired Reef, uh, which is a US third party funds manager, uh, primarily core, but multi-strategy. I think at the time they had around 17 billion in assets under management. And then they, uh, they went to raise a fund, a global fund, uh, for real estate, private equity. Um, the capital raising went okay, but it didn't go great for emerging markets. So because of the restrictions at the time around emerging markets, I think they had a, there was a very small amount of money available for Asia, uh, Eastern Europe, and, uh, and Central and South America where we had operations. And, uh, and so I was part of uh, quite a large group of people that were rationalized, um, which sounded terrible, but actually, uh, thanks to uh, Deutsche Bank's attractive carried interest program, um, it was actually quite profitable. Um, and, uh, and actually, that's a really important lesson. Uh, and it's something that for our business, when I started Seaforth, um, You'll hear a lot in the market about carried interest programs that have lots of promise, but you know rarely deliver. Uh, often broken promises, um, and and part of that is that entrepreneurs might promise a carried interest program, not document it correctly, 
not really deliver full transparency. And then, you know, when it comes to cash on the table, they start recutting the deal. Um, and you hear about that a lot. So when we set up Seaforth, that was one of the pledges that, you know, Kurt and I both agreed. Uh, if we're focused on building a legacy business, which I'd love to get get to at some point, um, the the this is one really critical element to building a legacy business to make sure that you're really creating alignment with your team and that uh, that the team have visual you know focus on how much money you can make by doing a great job in your uh, in your role and and often businesses I, I kind of it's like a pyramid. A lot of these businesses, the top three guys make carry and the rest of the people, it's a black box. They have no idea how much money is being made. There's often two models. There's an asset performance model and then there's a joint venture model. At C4, there's one model. Everybody knows how much money is made. Everybody knows how much carry can potentially be made. That's proper alignment. And, and it gets people like this weekend, I think we had five or six people working over the weekend on something it's you know i don't feel bad about doing it but it's like we all have to do it i was working as well but it's like when you're when you're focused on generating carried interest profit it is it's life-changing and and for me that experience at deutsche bank uh it it made you know what happened next and what happened and you know it made my ability to set up c fourth land profitable so let's talk about that journey because you yeah. came, um, you did a stint back in North America, right? Before you came to the UK or? No, I bought, um, so I bought a couple of apartment buildings in Vancouver. Um, I, I stayed in, uh, I stayed in Hong Kong. Um, and um, so when I, um, when I left uh, Deutsche, uh, I bought one building down in well, central Vancouver, uh, 18 units. And then I bought another uh, 29 unit apartment building. Um, and, uh, and then I joined uh, a firm called JP Morgan, um, which was the, uh, it was the real estate special situations business, um, which that was back in, uh, in 2006, which was a great time. Uh, it, it was a great time because if you remember, there was a lot of hubris and, and we, I think, you know, I, I was responsible for investing over four, maybe 500 million in a year at JP Morgan. Uh, and uh, we made good money on those investments. And then unfortunately, um, well, not unfortunately, I was offered a uh, hundred million pounds to set up a separate account or set up a private equity business. That was Urban Land Capital, which was a really tough call. Um, and it, because I was loving what I was doing at JP Morgan, uh, Ralph Parks, who was the CEO at JP Morgan in Asia, um, it had become a, you know, he was my boss and a mentor of mine. Uh, he's actually on our, our board of advisors, uh, today and, um, and an incredible, uh, you know, had an incredible career and has been a real mentor. Um, and Ralph, Ralph was like, hey, don't do it. Uh, and I, I did it anyways. And, uh, um, because it's a hundred million pounds and a uh, hundred million dollars. And I really, I wanted to own my own business. Yeah, Set up your own business. Yeah, and... man. Um, so that was in 2007, just before the global financial crisis, uh, freaking terrible, terrible timing had set up the office, hired people. Where, where was the office? Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, hired people. And then all hell broke loose again. Uh, so second time, first Asia financial crisis, now global financial crisis. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I worked through uh, 2008, 9, um, going into 10, uh, JP Morgan, Ralph had come back, said, how's it going? And I said, well, not great. And, and one of the things he had said is, uh, which is a common thing in banking, uh, if uh, if you leave, uh, if you leave, you can't come back, right? And and that's because a lot of people leave banking and they want to set up their own business and they want to keep their people in, and you got to think really hard about it. Um, and and that's what Ralph had said to me. Look, at, if 
if you leave, you can't come back. And I said, yeah, I get it. I've got to do this. And he said, well, look, I, I know I said, if you leave, you can't come back. But that, there's actually a really interesting role in the global real assets business, the, the asset management business that uh, you should be you should look at. Um, and, and so I did. I, I'd gone back. I should say one of the interesting deals that I'd done, because uh, it ties into later, uh, was, uh, was with Loda developers in Mumbai. Um, so in the JP Morgan business, we'd done a, uh, a direct uh, structured equity investment with Loda in a development, uh, Mahalaksmi, which is in, in Mumbai. Uh, and that was the first time I got to meet a gentleman by the name of Abhinandan Loda, who is still a friend. Uh, and, and really an exceptional, uh, exceptional businessman, um, a young man who's just grown his business from strength to, to strength. Um, and of course, during the, uh, when I'd set up Urban Land Partners, they had a challenge with a uh, debt restructuring following the global financial crisis. They had a large uh, pre-IPO convertible bond. I had actually been involved in a bond restructuring in Indonesia uh, when I was with Salim. And he called me in and said, hey, can you help give me some advice on this? Um, and so I'd gone to Mumbai uh, and helped them with the restructuring of their debt while I was at Urban Land Partners. And it was, they were generous in paying me well for that. Um, but it was also the um, the relationship with the Lotus, uh, with Abhinandan, uh, you know, grew out of that. And, and what I saw was uh, a gentleman who um, integrity was really important. And even during the debt restructuring, um, there were um, there were investors um, that were offering, they, I should say, investors in the bonds that were saying, look, we'll take 50 cents in the dollar. Uh, and Abhinandan uh, said, look, I don't want the market saying that, you know, they lost money. And uh, so he said he refused to do the 50% payout. And instead, uh, those investors on a pre-IPO convertible debt in 2007, I believe their yield to maturity was 13.65%. For that vintage, for 2007, through the, Asia, uh, the global financial crisis, to deliver those returns to the investors um, and to maintain your integrity, I, I you know, there are very few people like that in, in a lot of markets, let alone in, in Mumbai. And so that kind of set the stage for the, the later decision with Loda. Which is the move to the UK, right? Correct. So after the global real assets business, which was a really important part of, you know, my, my career development, uh, working with the largest. Now suddenly, you know, I'm a managing director responsible across Asia to meet with and advise the largest institutional investors on real estate investing strategy um, and investing in funds, investing in separate managed accounts. These are the, the state administration for foreign exchange. It's the NPSs. It's, it's, you know, the Hong Kong monetary authorities. These are like massive institutional investors across Asia. Um, you learn a really important language. Uh, the language that starts with what happens at the top of the house with allocations to understand, you know, the role of core real estate, which represents 55% of all global allocations to real estate. Um, you know, that's our true north. We forget that sometimes when we're private equity guys and we're doing value add. But actually, the goal, if you're doing value add right, it's value add to core. Yeah. Right. If you're doing core plus, it's core plus. To core. core, if you're doing development, it's development to core. Because to, of the global allocation to real estate, 55% of it is looking for core products. That's, that's right. But also, also, if you think about it in a different way, if you're not getting to core, it means your exit value isn't going to be at the level that you want it to be because the liquidity, to your point, the 55%. To get to that liquidity uh, means you have to deliver a core product, which is not easy. Right. And what is a core product for someone who, who doesn't necessarily know what core means? So the definition of core cash flows is long-term reliable cash flows with inflation hedging characteristics and low correlation to fixed income and equities. That's the definition of core real estate. The, the It gets blurred and people try to, you know, recharacterize it, but that's it. And, and that 
that speaks to the empathy at the top of the house. That and that's because the majority of that capital is what pension fund driven or it's long term sustainable and it needs um, redemption matched sustainable income. It's, it's less about that and it's more about if we go back to, let's say you're a pension investor, all right, uh, and you you have you have to match your investments, your assets to your liabilities, which are your pension holders, so they can have a, a successful retirement. Um, so, so if you think about your pension holders, the guy at allocation, the guy or, or girl at allocation that's deciding where the money goes, they'll say, okay, a certain amount of money is going to go to fixed income, super safe, low volatility traditionally. Um, and then the other, another element will go to equities and then another element will go to alternatives. And within alternatives, there'll be real estate, there'll be hedge funds, there'll be private equity, there'll be infrastructure, there's a broad range of asset classes that go to alternatives. Um, real estate real estate sits in that bucket and has to deliver returns along with the other alternatives that are offer low correlation to the volatility of fixed income and equities. So in a perfect world, you know, your, your equities portfolio may be going down, but then your alternatives are going up you have less volatility with regards to your valuations on your private assets as you do on your equities, and then your your fixed income may be doing something else. Yeah. So over time, you're delivering on your entire portfolio stable returns to your or to your uh, pension holders. And today, why it's hard to raise money for real estate is because the headwinds in terms of interest rates and inflation construction costs mean that that allocation towards real estate is reduced because they'd rather put it into other asset classes? Yeah, I I mean, I think it's it's probably even deeper than that. I think, um, you know, more Machiavellian uh, real estate in, in, has been getting crushed because of the valuation shift, um, which means a lot of institutional investors, um, the euphemism is ores in the water, right? They're managing, they're asset managing their existing investments. It takes time when you get, you know, a, a, have an impact to real estate values like we've had over the last, you know, couple of years or really since the beginning of COVID. It takes time to really understand the health of your portfolio. These are each individual asset is very different. And so institutional capital is looking at their assets under management and saying, right, where do we really sit? Where do we stand with regards to the health of our portfolio? What do we want to sell? What do we want to keep? And then once they understand where that is, then they can start rebalancing, starting to add. And, 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 and I think that's happening slowly because yeah. it's still dynamic. We're still, you know, the whole question of interest rates and are they up for longer or not is, is still up for grabs. Uh, the influence of inflation on that and therefore what is exit value of an asset? You've got within each of these asset classes, like for instance, offices, you've got this whole question of how much of this impact is cyclical, I think quite little, versus structural, I think quite a lot, right? And, and so the structural impact of loss of demand for offices, uh, what does that mean for your existing portfolio? What does that mean for assets that you want to buy? Uh, and so I think that's what institutional investors are are struggling with today. And, and because of that, because of a balance of what they're managing in their own portfolios, and you know, as they evolve to understand where they need to rebalance their capital and their allocations, that's why money is slowly returning into the space. Let's go back to the loader piece, because I'm also yeah. keen to talk about C4 and why you set that up. You did a, a short stint at loader. Can you just talk about that role and why you took it and then and then just take the story on from there. Yeah, um, I was a managing director at JP Morgan. They're just an awesome firm. Um, I can't say enough about uh, how professional they are. That you know, I, I always use the analogy of you know, if you're sprinting down a field, imagine you've got two hundred and eighty thousand employees. I think back then it was like two hundred and forty thousand, but you're sprinting down the field with the ball. You can pass it left or right, and no, even a blind pass, there's somebody there to catch it, all right? And then you keep sprinting, right? Everybody is driven 
Everybody's incredibly intelligent. Everybody knows their role and they're working towards their, their, their common objectives and their individual objectives. That's a high performance organization. It's why if you keep looking at JP Morgan stock under Jamie Dimon's leadership, you know, they've just got really great people at the top of the house and it filters all the way down to, you know, analysts and associate. So, um, you know, the JP Morgan experience was phenomenal. Um, but I had already been bitten by the bug, um, you know, of, of, of running a business and, uh, and, and also, you know, as I reflect, as you get older, you start reflecting on what are the elements of your career that you love the most. All right. For me, it's the tangibility of delivering built developments, high quality built developments. Making money is really important. You can do both. You can deliver high quality, beautiful developments and make money. And, you know, I had the benefit of working for a gentleman by the name of David Salim at Salim Group. And, and, and that guy um, was so focused on development, uh, on, on development quality. Um, he, he was one of those, one of those people that would run the numbers on the back of an envelope and be within, you know, four or 3%. Like he really, he got it. He understood the numbers and he'd always say, okay, now, now go underwrite that. Let's just make sure my numbers are right. But I think this makes sense. Uh, but, but also working with best in class consultant teams, you know, engineers, architects, designers, landscape architects, um, you know, that, you know, that's a journey. When you're developing, you own an asset, you own it for the entire time, right? When it's built, you get to stand there and say, I was involved. You don't see it, but there was a column right there and we moved it and it made room for the dining room, which now sits eight instead of six, right? You know, things like that's an actual situation, but the, that that matters a lot. And I think it hopefully it translates into, you know, what we're doing at Seaforth and the beautiful developments that we're working on here. Um, but but also um, that passion, it doesn't get you can't replace it with making money. If you're just doing real estate, private equity, I God bless all the my colleagues that are in the debt side of the business, they're making lots of money right now. I've done the debt side of the business. I'm, I guess you're making money, like, but for me- You want something more, a little I, bit more purposeful. There's something about the, the legacy, the tangibility of, um, of delivering and contributing to the built environment that I think we all have a responsibility for uh, to do. And, uh, and for me, I take that responsibility seriously, but it also, the, the psychic, uh, positive feedback from that, I, it's irreplaceable. So you were CEO of Loda yes. UK. Yeah. Um, can you just talk to me about that? Yeah, we bought one Grosvenor Square um, and 48 Carey Street, uh, two, two fantastic sites. Uh, one Grosvenor Square is, I think, today one of the best, you know, most luxurious residential developments in London. Um, amazing address quiet now about to be across uh, directly opposite a Rosewood hotel, which will be an incredible six star hotel. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then 48 Carey street, which is next to the Royal courts of justice, um, which was an old building that was, uh, replaced with a uh, new residential. Um, the, um, the, the loader experience, uh, was great. I mean, we hit the ground running, acquired or took an office, started hiring people, um, the, there were two brothers in Loda. There are two brothers in Loda. Um, they had a, a, a disagreement on the direction of the business. Um, and, uh, and I kind of felt I was getting caught in the middle of it. Uh, and so decided to let the brothers resolve their differences, which they've now done. Um, but, uh, but, you know, at, at that time, I, I think it was pretty remarkable. People were like, okay, you moved to London, right? You, you know, you're a Canadian. You don't have a lot of experience in doing business in London. What makes you think you can be successful in London? Um, I believe that our skill sets are fungible. And the advice that I give to young people today, if they want to work overseas and, and you've got a foundation of good real estate knowledge, 
your skill sets are fungible. And I think that's really valuable advice. Uh, and it's important advice. Um, if you work with integrity and you have a really strong work ethic, um, if you hire great people and empower them, um, if you've got a commitment to planning your work and working your plan, right? Don't just wing it. It's the, you can't wing it in this business. You've got to be in the weeds every single day, right? Um, that I think is a, is a massive differentiator. There are a lot of people that are kind of coasting that are doing what they're doing, but, but not on their toes and being ready to pivot, being ready to, you know, interrogate what they're doing, uh, challenge the status quo, um, things that I think are second nature to us at Seaforth. Um, and, uh, and that's what I think gave me the, um, the, the confidence to say, I think there's an opportunity here. Also, you know, I, I did a business plan. Um, I looked at our competition. I saw that very few, if any of the operating partners out there were FCA regulated. Uh, I saw that most of them, most of the people that came out of that business were on the brokerage side of the business. It was more of a trading mentality as opposed to, you know, development um, and, uh, and, and fiduciary and investment management side of the business. Um, and, and so I saw a niche that I thought we could, uh, we could take advantage of. So going on that entrepreneurial, time, entrepreneurial journey for the second time, yeah. led you to setting uh, C4 up with a, with a bank of experience across North America uh, Asia in lots of different guises. How did you set the business up and what was the kind of the business plan that you landed on and what did you want to explore? It was a bootstrap culture. Um, so really, uh, it is a bootstrap culture. And, and I, what I mean by that is, um, I think you can lean in and go take offices in Mayfair and say, I've got to look the part uh, and, and, you know, be that because I'm ex JP Morgan and spend a lot of money. Um, but really, I think for most of our peers in the industry, the proof is in how you do it, right? And and so our first, uh, the first, you know, when I started, it was out of my office at home. Um, and I just started underwriting deals, started looking at the market, uh, speaking to my network of, of investors, saying, look, here's what I think, here's how I underwrite, you know, taking out floor plans, talking to architects, speaking with planners, uh, doing everything that you need to do if you're gonna be an operating partner, uh, but doing it on my own. Um, I think people started to see, uh, wow, actually, you know, you are multidisciplinary. You've got real estate finance. You understand the questions that we're gonna ask. You've got high quality underwriting memos. You've got feasibility analysis and pro formas and, and you understand what's moving the market. Um, one of those early uh, partners was um, was Goodwin Gaw, Gaw Capital, um, who is not related, although his, uh, my last name is Goodwin, his first name is Goodwin, um, uh, and a lovely guy. Um, and, uh, and there was a building in Clark and Well Green that I'd identified that um, was, I think, just fantastic value. Um, and uh, I reached out to him, said, hey, you know, I found I found something. We looked at a couple of other things uh, that he was interested in, and he said, "Look, keep looking. We'll find something." And sure enough, uh, we did. Um, and uh, I hired a couple of guys. Those two guys are still with me today: uh, John Baker and Luigi Pichetta. Um, and uh, we moved into the ground floor of that building. Uh, into you know, it's a turn of the century Victorian. Kind of warehouse space, exposed brick, quite cool the way we'd done it, but but really not overspending. Lots of long nights. There were a few nights where literally we worked overnight, like no sleep, um, and uh, to to grow the business and to to you know from there we started expanding our our network with investors and 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 started to identify more opportunities in the market. Um, then Brexit happened and, uh, and this is actually a really valuable lesson, uh, that, that I took from my prior experience in the global financial crisis. So during the global financial crisis, I'd set up this business. I didn't have 
the knowledge of institutional investors to, you know, when, when all hell broke loose, my, my backer for a hundred million, his commitment evaporated. Um, and went like, you know, he, I think two of his banks were underwater and he was in trouble. Um, and so I'd had this capital commitments facility that didn't materialize. Um, and I didn't go out and speak to other investors. I was, I probably should have in hindsight, but I didn't know those investors. All right. Um, so when I'd gone back to JP Morgan, that was a gap in my knowledge that I was able to fill through the role that I had. Um, and that when the global or when the, uh, when Brexit happened, I, we all recognized it for what it was, which was an own goal. In my opinion, it's, I'll probably get into trouble for saying, for saying that. But, but, uh, but also that it was going to scare, uh, scare investors away, uh, which it did. Um, we immediately, one of the things that Seaforth does, I'm um, really proud of is our in-house research. We spend a lot of time analyzing the market. Our research has been published in a bunch of magazines and, and, and the FT. Um, and I'm actually writing an article right now. Um, but, but the, we, we put together uh, a piece of research called Bracing for Opportunity. We did it in about three weeks. There was a lot of sleepless nights then, analyzing what was happening and what was likely to play out and where were the risks and where was the opportunity and the threats because every investor was asking the same question. Okay, what next? Now, now that research helped to, to convey, because actually we got that research out before any of our peers. Of course, the big houses were publishing research, but who's this little operating partner that's publishing research? And we were sending it to our you know the clients that we're speaking with. And it, again, helped to differentiate the thoughtfulness um, that with which we approach the market. But also, um, one of the things we advised is that we shouldn't be investing right now. So here we're a new new business, and you know you make money. You only make money when you're investing. Quite. And I'm telling investors don't invest. Uh, it's the same thing that we did following 2019, right? When it's like, okay, you know, I think on average prior to this we were maybe bidding on 13 or 14, you know, real deals. I think through COVID we may have bid on four. I mean, just so selective on what we thought we could make money on. Um, but uh, but we actually said, look, this is not the time. This is what's going to happen next. There's going to be a, a decline. There's going to be a decline in transactions. This is where we think the focus of uh, should be, but not yet. And just watch and wait and we'll let you know. And people were like, how can you afford to do this? And it's like, well, how can I afford not to do this? We're building a business. That's, you know, if you're building a legacy business and you're giving poor advice, that's going to come back to bite you in the ass. If you lean in and do stupid deals, people are going to look back and say, why did you do that deal? That was a stupid deal. And, and so, you know, there's a difference between getting it wrong, right? And that can happen and, and being foolish, right? Just like, because I need to get a deal done sort of mentality and, 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 we're not ever going to be that side of the equation, and and really we've been we've been good at not getting it wrong either. Um, but uh, but it is because of our our research based uh, approach. Every year around this time, uh, we do a, a big ideas. It's a three three month process where it's a deep dive on the market, um, and every year it reveals massive insights that we're like, oh my god didn't even think about that. Um, it, it's what got us early on the importance of sustainability, identifying this green wave that was coming and, and seeing it as for what it was, an opportunity, but also a threat. It's how Space House, our biggest asset in Covent Garden, which was Briam Excellent, how we mid-business plan moved it to Briam Outstanding, right? Which is very hard to do. And in fact, we were told we were told because it had never been done before, a listed building being made into Briam Outstanding, that it couldn't be done, and we did it. Uh, we're doing it, uh, and uh, and so I think the uh, 
you know, the, the, the big ideas research that we do is an important part of our business. Uh, and back in, um, back in 2016, post Brexit, it's really what differentiated us and, and helped us to build other relationships and, and build our, our AUM to where it is today. Can you just give me an overview of the assets, just a quick one minute overview of yeah. the assets in your portfolio? You've already touched on Space House, which is probably your kind of flagship or most or best, best known yeah, asset. Yeah, um, I, I mean, we're, we're total around uh, just about 600,000 square feet. Um, Space House is 200 and 60,000 square feet of net internal area. It's looking incredible. I mean, that will be London's only mid-century loft type offices, um, loft style offices. And uh, just, I'm so proud of it. It's, it's honestly, everyone in the organization is so proud of it. Some people kind of look at it and go, but how does it work? It's a round building. It's 10,000 square foot floor plates in Covent Garden incredible views on an acre of land it's i mean there's just so much uh, and and in this world where tenants need demand employees need and demand interesting experiential highly amenitized locations with great connectivity it's a it's a no-brainer yeah, it's an amazing asset i I, I went around um the kodak building which clearbell have yeah. uh, developed which is right next door right next door um and it was great to kind of go up and i could i could see space house from a few different levels but um yeah. i'll have to um i'll have to nag you for a for a visit yeah when, uh, no, when, no, it, no, when, no. when it's Any, open my, my pleasure the the other um um so bleeding heart yard yeah bleeding heart yard um which uh we um that's something that's been getting all sorts of awards and recognition um, it's a 1971 building. All of our buildings are refurbs. I should state that. Mm. Uh, I mean, through that, I think we preserve 17 million, uh, kilograms of carbon. Um, I might get, might've got that wrong. Um, so I'll fact check that for you. Um, but, but a uh, significant amount, a lot. Um, and, uh, but we're, um, that project is a 1971 brick building that, uh, we infilled with mass timber on the top, um, and uh, well before people were talking about the importance of mass timber as a as an alternative building material, the carbon sequestering nature of it. But also, as a Canadian, I grew up being surrounded with mass timber, and it's such a beautiful material. Um, and uh, and as you're probably aware, Julius Baer moved into that building. There's a great interview that I did with the CEO of uh, Julius Baer UK. Uh, his name is David Durlocker, um, about why he chose that building. And I think the most, the most important line there for me um, is uh, that he looked at over 32 glass box buildings before realizing that he needed something different, something experiential, something special to earn the commute of their employees. Uh, and, uh, and he's a, I mean, he's a, another great example of a visionary leader in the industry that, you know, if you go visit their offices, last time I was there, he was in the second floor, you know, at a stand-up cube working with the the team, um, you know, at a stand-up desk, the sky is different. And, um, and I think it's the direction that the industry is going. Uh, agent, the, I should say tenants today, uh, you know, this unfolds slowly, tenancies expire slowly. Um, but we're starting to see, you, you've seen two massive uh, tenants leave uh, Canary Wharf. Uh, we're seeing tenants leave the city to go to the West End. Um, we're seeing the type of buildings that people choose as being far more experiential, unique, not glass box buildings. These glass box buildings are both a terrible environmental uh, footprint, but also are, are you know, emblematic of a, of a bygone time when, you know, uh, you know, like when I started working in banking, I wanted to work on a trading floor. That was like, cool, right? Now, you know, this next generation of talent today, 53% of all office based employment in London is Gen Z and millennials. It's going to 68% in the next six years. And they don't want to work on a factory floor. They, they want different. These are the same young people that are driving vintage clothing to, you know, in the next six years, surpass fast fashion as the size of the market. 
these are people that want cool and interesting and, and, you know, want to have a lower carbon footprint and want to work for organizations that have values and purpose and are also concerned about their role in the environment. This refurbishment of market of product is not just good for the environment. It's actually what tenants want. Yeah, hundred percent. I was gonna, uh, I was gonna ask, how does the wider industry um, <clears throat> go about refitting and repurposing the kind of sheer quantum of real estate needed? Um, because surely that is a huge challenge. Yeah, and we probably um, don't have enough time, frankly, yeah, no. to get into it. Well, now, here's but- here's what I would say. It's not. Um, you know, I, I, I talked about the deterioration of structural demand. Um, the, the fact is there are a lot of buildings, B and C grade buildings that are sitting vacant today that are not going to get reoccupied. And, In their current use. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Can they get adaptive reuse? That's going to be a planning decision, right? And, and right now, the, the problem, I mean, we have a housing crisis. A bit, a bit tangential, but we have a housing crisis. Rents last year, 15% growth. This year could be close to that again. We saw new leases, the rental growth in Edinburgh, which is a rent control market, rise by 13% year to date. This is not year to date, it lasts 12 months. Um, there's a, a housing crisis and we're failing to deliver stock um, and developers can't afford to deliver stock. Even at depressed pricing, the affordability requirement, which is obviously important as well, the developers are like, they just can't make the numbers work. And so no stock is getting built right now. And and so we have a crisis. There is an opportunity with these office buildings, but it's gonna take some really hard decisions by by the government to to accept uh, and to, you know, there are some planners that still think that they need to pre- preserve um, the employment generating space. Uh, now, employment space is important, but given the extreme level of vacancy that we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing zone one buildings doing zero rent, just pay rates and pay service charge in zone one. This is this is bloodshed. We're seeing lenders saying, I don't want to lend to offices anymore. If you're in a B or C grade building, it's not clear whether you're going to have financing when it comes up, right? And, and then you've got the the MIS regulations, which to be clear, I am 100% supportive of. We need MIS regulations. Our built environment is pumping out far too much carbon into the atmosphere. We need to make these buildings energy efficient, all right? So I'm not saying... We should scrap the MIS regulations, far from it, all right? The, the, the draft regulations are saying that buildings need to be EPCC by 2027, all right? And potentially EPCB by 2030. More than 50% of stock is not EPCC or better right now, or is not, is EPCC or worse. Um, if you think about B and C grade buildings, proportionally much higher share is going to be falling on B and C grade buildings. So these landlords are losing tenants, can't find new tenants, have massively increased debt financing costs, and potentially are getting phone calls from their lenders saying, look, we need a capital call. The new valuation has come in and you need to write a check for more equity. Or we're out, or we're just not lending to B grade offices anymore. Or brown offices anymore, and at the same time, they're expected to write checks for capex. This is this is a problem, and and so we can either get ahead of it, and when I say we, I mean really, it's the built environment, but it's also the the, um, the planners. Um, what I would say though, we are working with uh, with partners, and you know we've got our real estate uh, a Seaforth Solutions business. Uh, which is not us buying buildings with partners, but actually helping people that own real estate to reposition their buildings. So the Seaforth Solutions business is there for that. Um, and the, the the fact is some of these can be saved. Some of these buildings can be turned around um, and some cannot. 
And, and that's hard advice to give, right? Uh, we, we will partner with people. We can bring in fresh capital uh, and, and put capital into these buildings that we believe in. It's really tough when you have to tell somebody that actually this is no longer highest and best use. And if you could pursue all, an alternative use, that might be a better route. The yeah. challenge right now, though, is in a lot of these boroughs, they're still like, you know, preserving office space is sacrosanct. Um, and uh, and that, that unfortunately, is, uh, you know, because they're trying to preserve their rate space, I think the rate space is uh, is is not coming back to, to where it was before. I've got so many more questions for you, and I think we could spend so much more time on C4, maybe round two of the podcast in yeah, the future. Um, a, a question as we draw to a close that I ask everyone on the podcast um, is, if I gave you 500 million pounds worth of capital, who are the people, what property, in which place would you look to deploy that capital? Yeah, you can just write us a check. We'll <laughs> but um, if you, but, but outside of, but outside of that, yeah, no, I'm being facetious, of course. Um, look, uh, 500 million pounds today. Um, it's tough to put money to work. All right, it's tough to put money to work. Uh, I would, I, I do believe that uh, that buying the right buildings in the right locations and repositioning them is still a really smart business. I think exit cap rates, if you look at the pool of institutional capital, uh, it's massive. If you think about the pool of institutional quality real estate, core real estate, it has shrunk considerably. So that's a lot more capital investing in a much smaller pond, all right? Notwithstanding what's happening today, I think inevitably when, when liquidity returns to the market, there'll be a new understanding of what qualifies as core. If you can make that or be that, you're going to win. All right. The, the, but also, if you think about the lack of really great experiential office buildings out there today, if you can be that and create that, you're also going to win. You're going to be the market. You're going to be the price maker as opposed to the price taker. Um, so I, I think that's a really smart strategy. I do think residential, when policy gets it right, um, unfortunately, right now, it's almost like there's a there's a. It's almost like the biggest developers of residential are on strike because the math just isn't making sense. Um, and, uh, but, but I do think, uh, I put some of that money into residential, just into a strategy, just, you got to try to figure out what the strategy is. Um, because, uh, if not for anything else to help abate the crisis that's evolving right now in housing. Well, Tyler, you've, uh, you've had a fascinating background career and, uh, excited to see what you and the, the C4 team go on to do how you navigate the interesting market opportunity that lies ahead. And uh, yeah, keen to go and check out Space House when you've uh, PC'd it. Thanks, Matt. Not at all. Well, look, all the best. And um, yeah, excited to see what you guys do. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of People, Property, Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague. Give us a rating, like, or comment. It helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations of guests that we should have on the show or areas of the market we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People, Property, Place podcast is powered by Rockborn. The team recruit leadership and future leadership hires for real estate owners, funds, investors, and developers. So if you're looking to hire top talent for your business, head over to the website www.rockborn.com where you'll be able to find a wealth of information or feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn. Have a great day wherever you are and I look forward to catching you next time.